We go through life making choices. This is why our lives have meaning. If we made no choices, we'd be like machines, the gears turning around but with no purpose. At least the machine itself has no purpose. There are people who will give a purpose to the machine. But that's because they're the ones making choices. And our choices shape our experience. As the Buddha says, we take the potentials for form, feeling, perceptions, fabrications, consciousness, and we fabricate them into these things, into actual forms, feelings, etc for the sake of something, usually for the sake of happiness, which means that every present moment has a for the sake of in it. It's moving in a direction, means to an end. That's why things have meanings. They are aimed at something. This is why memory plays a large role, because it gives us guidance in how to shape things. And this is the main reason why our memories have meaning, because they've given us lessons. We can think of things that we did well in the past, things that we did poorly in the past. We can take it as a lesson. We have memories that have meaning for us personally, memories that give meaning to us in the world at large, and give us a sense of the importance of our choices. And the Buddha does have us cultivate memory in a certain way for the sake of the path. This is what right mindfulness is all about the things we should keep in mind, how we keep them in mind, what was part of the path, an important part of the path. As the Buddha said, right mindfulness hovers around every other factor. Once we have right view, then we need right mindfulness to remember right view, so we can exert right effort to give rise to the right factors. So we're not totally abandoning memory. We're learning how to use it well. It's just that there are other memories that come up as we meditate. And from the point of view of the practice, we have to learn how to see them in light of the Dharma, as to whether they're going to be meaningful for us or not. So we have to learn how to put aside that question of meaningful for us personally, just in terms of our sense of self, and meaning for us in terms of our role in the world. Because those kinds of meanings can actually get in the way of the practice. Think of the Buddha on the night of his awakening. First watch of the night, memories of many past lives going back hundreds of thousands of aeons. Lots of details that he could just feed on if he'd wanted to. And there were meditators in the past who did. They got memories of past lifetimes, and that's how they set themselves up as teachers. But the Buddha had so many memories that it all began to become meaningless. As he said, what did he remember? His appearance, his name, his experience of pleasure and pain, the food that he ate, and then the fact that he died. And then happened again and again and again, eating, dying, eating, dying. And he wondered, is there a pattern to all of this? Is there a lesson to be drawn? That's when he got into the second knowledge. This is where he saw the whole universe of beings dying and being reborn, in line with their actions. Their actions were shaped by their views who they associated with. 
Again, he could have spent the whole of his life feeding off of that knowledge. But the fact that he saw the pattern raised the question, could this all be put to an end? Because it's all pretty meaningless. Beings rise and then they fall. Then they rise and they fall time and time and time again. When will there ever be rest? He saw that it was because of intentions, which were the actions, and attention, the views, the things that you paid attention to. These were the things that determined the rise and the fall. Would there be attentions and intentions that could bring all of this to an end? So he extracted the pattern, extracted the lesson, and then let all those memories go, focused in on the present moment remembering just enough to see how it can take apart this process of constant fabrication in the present moment, to find something unfabricated. So he was able to extract a really useful meaning out of these memories, but then he had to put them aside. What's a little disturbing for a lot of us is that once he'd arrived at total awakening in nirvana, there was no need for meanings anymore. There was no more for the sake of anything, because everything up to that point was for the sake of this total release. But once the release is gained. It has no meaning in and of itself. It's gone beyond meaning. But for those of us who still live by meanings, it's unnerving to think about it. We keep thinking, if I let go of the, the personal meaning I get out of things, or the, my sense of my importance in the world, what do I have left? When someone's in nirvana, they have no longer any sense or any need for being important in the world. And it's hard for us to think about that. It's good that awakening comes in stages. With stream entry, you don't totally let go of your sense of self. There still is that lingering sense of I am, as Venerable Kamaka said, that hovers around the aggregates, lingers around the aggregates. But the fact that you have seen the deathless at that point helps you to realize this lingering sense of I am is something that you actually do want to let go of at some point. You're not going to let go of this until you've seen that there really is something better. And that's what stream entry gives you. You get a taste to say, yes, this really is better. That's what confirms you in your realization, okay, this would be a really good thing. Because otherwise it sounds chilling. No more meaning, no more importance. No more memories. That's because there's something better. Always keep that in mind. We look at the Buddha after his awakening, he still had his memories. Those memories of previous lifetimes his memories even of this lifetime. He would call on them every now and then. To teach a Dharma lesson. As long as he could see that they would have meaning for somebody else, he would engage in them. But for as his own needs, he didn't need them anymore. There's a time near us total passing away, when Ananda came to us and said, don't die, in the, don't pass away, don't enter total nirvana in this little tiny dusty town. Go to one of the great cities. There are a lot of people there with faith. They'll take care of your, your funeral. And the Buddha said, don't call this a little dusty town. This used to be the capital of a wheel-turning monarch. 
He himself was the wheel turning monarch at that time. And he talked about how great the city was, but now it's all gone. Another Dharma lesson. And as for his importance, shortly before he did pass into total nirvana, he said to the monks, as for the minor training rules, if the Sangha sees fit, they can do away with any of the ones that they want to do away with. Now this statement is, has a lot of meanings in different ways. But one of them here, of course, is that you think about the Venya was one of the Buddha's main accomplishments. The Dharma, as he said, was something that he discovered. But the Venya was something that he formulated. And here at this point he was handing it over to the monks. He's no longer laying claim to one of his main accomplishments. And in one way this was basically a challenge to them. He had told them many, many times if they really cared about the long life of the, the teaching, they wouldn't undo any of the, any of the rules at all. So what this meant was if they were going to continue the teaching, it was totally up to them. They would show his loyalty, not by simply saying, well, the Buddha said we had to hold by the rules, but by saying we chose to hold by the rules. But for the Buddha himself, this was a gesture of saying, okay, no more need to be important in the world. No more need to be meaningful in the world. He was going to go for total peace. So those are some of the memories that the Buddha would put down, let go of, for something much better. Think about that when you find yourself getting engaged in other memories. How do your memories compare to the Buddha's? And are they really worth holding on to? to squeeze out that last little bit of meaning, that last little bit of importance. See them as opportunities to learn lessons, Dharma lessons. Take the lesson and let everything else go. When you think in those terms, your faculty of memory will, is actually an aid in the practice and not a hindrance. It becomes part of a right view and right mindfulness. But it does require putting aside the particularity of your memories. This happened at that time. You said this, you said that, they said this, they said that. Those are scraps. Don't let yourself feed off scraps when there's so much better to feed on. So many other things that are better to feed on. The things that when you feed on them can take you to a point where you no longer need to feed.